with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of beholding innocent, bitter sufferings and death, of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us rise as we join in the intro and print it in your worship full.
trust in you. Strengthen our faith and give us courage to believe that in your love you will rescue us from all adversities. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for the 10th Sunday after Pentecost is from Genesis chapter 9. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the dark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you, for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in the close of the commandments and its meaning. What does God say about all these commandments? He says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. What does this mean? God threatens to punish all who break these commandments. Therefore, we should fear his wrath, and not do anything against them. But he promises grace and every blessing to all who keep these commandments. Therefore, we should also love and trust in him and gladly do what he commands. The epistle reading is again from St. Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, the third chapter. St. Paul writes, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for the Holy Gospel. Immediately, 
Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We confess our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for our sermon.
the word of the Lord. He meant to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Over the last few weeks, we have encountered texts in Mark's Gospel that involve both faith and fear. Remember, only a few weeks ago, we found the disciples again in the Sea of Galilee in a boat, afraid during a great storm, while Jesus was asleep. Before they awoken him, and he called out with a word and calmed the storm. Or Jairus and his wife who were afraid at the news that his daughter had died. Or that woman who was suffering from a sickness for 12 years, who was afraid of what might happen if she came near to Jesus and touched the hem of his garment. And what may happen if she was not healed? We saw the fear of Jesus' own hometown over his preaching, and the fear of the offense that Herod and Herodias had at John's preaching last week. You would think that the disciples would get it, but here we are again, out on the Sea of Galilee with a stiff wind battering their boat, keeping them from being able to reach the coast, and the disciples find themselves full of fear. <coughs> In fact, you might be thinking to yourself, man, these twelve are afraidy cats. It seems like every time we turn the page in Mark's Gospel, the disciples are afraid again. The disciples and the people of Jesus encounter in our gospel readings aren't the only ones who struggle with fear. I know many of you do as well. For some of you, it's simply every time you boot up your computer or open the browser on your iPhone. Check your mail. Talk with family. Go to the doctor. Dealing with a bully at school. Struggling with a spouse or parents. I get it. We're all afraid. As do the disciples, they get it. And so does the Lord. But let me make this very, very clear to you. Fear is a very terrible God. Now, I'm not talking about fear of the Lord right at the moment. I'll speak on that in just a few minutes. Right now, I'm talking about fear itself. There is no reward from fearing the things found in this world. For our fears only rule by threats. Do this or do that or something worse is going to happen to you. Fear offers you no freedom. In fact, oftentimes we actually talk about people fearing things and becoming paralyzed by it, where they can't do anything, they can't make decisions, they can't think clearly, and they come to a grinding halt in their lives. Simply put, fear not only controls, but it also enslaves us. 
Now, I understand that sometimes fear does make us sensitive to certain situations. And it might even help heighten our senses and, and our thought processes and be able to find a way of escape or a way out of the problem that we find ourselves in. But what if there is no escape? Like the disciples in our gospel reading for today, who were rowing and rowing and rowing and rowing and rowing, and then all of a sudden a ghost shows up and they can't get away from the ghost? What are they to do then? Jump into the Sea of Galilee and hope that they're going to be able to swim to the coastline? What were they supposed to do? And that is exactly where we find the disciples in our gospel reading for this morning. Paralyzed with fear. They've been with Jesus for a while now. And remember how they've witnessed so many acts of Jesus' love and healing and care and providence. They heard Jesus preaching to them. And just a few hours before, they took part in one of the largest miracles by volume when their Lord fed thousands of men, women, and children with just five loaves and two fish. Should that not have bolstered the faith of the disciples as they were headed across the Sea of Galilee? In fact, it didn't, Mark says. They were utterly astounded, for they didn't understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Now don't forget the fact that at least four of these disciples were fishermen. They had worked daily on the Sea of Galilee. They had seen storms before. They had seen the wind. And you would have thought that that made it easier for them. But it didn't. For there was another layer that we must add to the buffeting winds on their boat. It is the fact that the ancient people also feared the deep. They feared the water, which for the ancient people came to symbolize death itself. In Genesis chapter 1, Moses tells us that the earth was formless and void and was covered by the deep. Later on in Genesis, as we heard this morning in our Old Testament reading, God had returned the earth to that very condition in the flood, when he again covered the face of the whole world with a water so deep that it covered over the tallest mountains, destroying all that was not saved in the ark. Noah and his family, eight souls in all. And so as the disciples are trying to row and struggle to make any sort of headway at all towards the shore, they can begin imagining themselves being swallowed up by the mythical creatures of the seas that came to symbolize the devil incarnate, an ancient serpent, the evil one, looking to devour and drag them down into the depths. But not only are they afraid of what might happen in the depths, Jesus himself adds fear to fear, danger to danger. By appearing to them after this long period of struggle, silent, which was worse, and walking upon 
upon the sea. For the disciples were unable to conceive that the one whom they had left ashore could be walking out to them on the sea. And immediately, as the disciples are probably deciding whether they jump into the sea or whether they arm themselves with their oars, getting ready to beat on whatever the ghost was about to do. Jesus says to them, Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them. And the wind ceased. Jesus simply spoke. The word that had created the world out of nothing spoke again. And not only brought calm to the seas of Galilee, but also calmed the hearts of the disciples. But his word did more than that. For Jesus didn't just walk past the disciples. He didn't just say, hey guys, take heart. I'll see you later. I'm going to the other side. I'll meet you there. He didn't wave to them on his way to Bethsaida. Say peace and keep on his merry way. No, he climbed into the boat with them. For it wasn't just his word, but it was also his presence that stilled their fears. For by Jesus and his word, he had again forgiven them. He had given them confidence. And the wind ceased. Now before I move on here for just a second, I want you to notice one last thing though. Where were the disciples originally headed? Where did Mark tell us that they were actually going to? That's right, Bethsaida. But is that where they ended up? No. Mark tells us that they ended up in Gennesaret where Jesus performed many miracles, especially in healing the sick. <coughs> I guess you could ask, was this where the Lord willed the disciples to be all along? And I'm pretty sure we could all confidently say, yes, that's where Jesus intended them to be anyways. But whether they had been in Bethsaida or whether they had been in Gennesaret, it was good. But it is also a reminder that there are at times as we face the fears that we have in our own lives, that the things that we had planned to do originally, whether it was going somewhere, whether it was how we wanted our disease healed, how we wanted other things to go in our lives, that there are at times when the Lord changes your plan. fit his will. In the Lord's Prayer, we don't pray, Lord, my will be done. But I'm pretty sure we were all taught to pray, thy will be done. I know fear dominates so many of your lives in so many different ways. Whether it's things that are happening in the near future. Or maybe your fear is of another nature. Maybe your fear has to do with your children and their own salvation. The fact that your children or your grandchildren have rejected God's word and his promises. In many cases, we can lessen or get rid of that fear by the things you do, by the things that you avoid. We try not to think about them. We try to ignore them. 
Instead of bringing them up during Thanksgiving dinner, we know that if we bring up church, and we bring up Jesus, then it will end up in just a really huge fight. And so we just keep our mouths shut. But I also know that many of us don't want to live in that fear. When we are, we work hard to change those situations. But there is also one other fear, though, that we can do nothing about. And it is the fear of God's wrath for our sins. For it dominates us, even if we don't realize it. For the power of guilt is fear, the fear that sooner or later God is going to get you for your sins that you did so long ago. The ones that keep haunting your dreams. The ones that you remember from so many years ago. It's the fear that makes us, I think, seek approval from others for our sins. At the root, it's why so many in our world today demand, especially within the church, that our sins would be recognized, that we would endorse other people's sins, and in fact, that we should praise the sins of other people. Oh, it's not just other people, but we do it too. Because by being praised by other sinners, it does make us feel a little bit less threatened by God. But even if you are sitting here this morning thinking to yourself, Pastor, I don't have any great skeletons in my closet. I don't have anything that I'm, that's keeping me up and awake at night. You might still live in fear and think, well, maybe I hope that I am good enough be saved. I've not exactly been the best Christian. I know I haven't loved as I should, I've spoken ill of others, I've hated people, I've coveted, I've stolen, and God knows I haven't trusted him like I should. And again, that fear becomes paralyzing. And it stops us from living in the freedom of Christ. It keeps us from trusting in God and loving our neighbors. Because that's what the law does. But God says more. He says, repent. Don't hide your fear from me. Confess it. Tell me the truth. Tell me the sins that you struggle with. That you deserve my wrath and that there is nothing that you can do about it. But don't shut him out at that point. Listen to his sweet word of gospel. For in this death and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So go. Fear no more. Go and sin no more. Be afraid of nothing. Don't fear your daughters. Don't fear your grandkids. Don't fear God's wrath. Because God has no wrath for you. For he loved you so much. That he poured it out on your son. His son. Your Savior. Jesus Christ. Believe it. For his sake. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your heart in true faith to life everlasting. Amen.
And I now invite you to please rise and join with me in the singing of the opera. Preserve us in the faith, 
so that Christ might dwell in our hearts richly until that day when we join them around your throne. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As the altar is prepared to, for us to receive the sacrament, I would invite those ladies and maybe those gentlemen who have mites to bring forward for the mic.
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. O Christ, our love of God, that us the way of sin of the
are now in peace and joy. Your sins are forgiven. Amen.
seated. Just a couple of things to remind you of. Um, shortly after the drawing, after we're done here, um, we'll be finishing up the viewing of Pilgrim's Progress downstairs. So if you want to come down and join us for um, watching the last part of the book um, on film, please do. I think we've got popcorn again this morning. Um, so please come and join us for that. Also, a uh, reminder, elders, we do have a special meeting coming up this Thursday evening. So guys, wherever other one of them, I'm not sure where Joseph's out. I'm assuming he's back. There he is. Um, I can see him back in the narthex. Anyways, guys, please remember that this coming Thursday evening. Also, a reminder that the church picnic is going to be coming up here in just a few weeks. Um, again, there is a sign-up sheet down on the first landing as you head out the side doors. Um, so if you're at all able to come or whether you're not 100% sure, please put your name on there so that will give us a chance to um, kind of figure out how much food that we need. And also if you're able to bring something or bring a game along to play during dinner or after dinner as well. And again, that will be taking place here at church on that August 15th. Also, for those of you who might be into scrapbooking, or maybe not just scrapbooking, but all sorts of crafts and those types of things, um, we're going to be having our scrapbooking day September 21st here at church again. I hear we've got quite a number that are already signed up, so if you're again thinking about whether you want to come and be a part of that, please get your name in sooner rather than later. You don't want to wait on that and then find out, well, there's no table space left. Um, then I guess you'd have to clean off my study. And if we have to clean off my desk in my study, it's going to cost you a double. So, <laughs> Renee's like, that sounds fair. <laughs> so anyway, um, please remember that as well, both ladies and gentlemen. Um, I believe that's about all we've got. Um, food pantry's coming up again in a couple of weeks. Just feels like we were on the second Saturday of the month. Yesterday. Yes. So, anyways, um, God's blessings be with all of you. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Mm -hmm.